Good evening, guys. Hi there. That was crap. We're in a bar, man. I say good evening, guys. Hey. That's what I'm talking about, man. We celebrate our faith, man. We don't mourn it. So I want to give you guys a couple updates on things before we get going. The uh, Thanksgiving dinner that we are doing on Thanksgiving, coincidentally. <laughs> um, it's going to be from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, unless we run out of food before 4 o'clock. It's going to be at 410 South Plenty Street, and we're going to set up right in, on the sidewalk in front of the apartments down there. And there's been door hangers in all the apartments down there, so they know about it. So if you guys know anyone who is alone on Thanksgiving or does not have money to have Thanksgiving, Send them down, man. It'll be cool. Everything's going to be in to-go containers so people can sit down and hang with us if they want. They can just take stuff and leave with them if they want. Um, if you got any questions about it, just hit me up and let me know. Uh, the other thing was an update on the trip that we made to Jersey. Um, me and Carson and Julie and Bill went down Friday night, and we hooked up with uh, the Vineyard Church down there in Morris Plains. We brought a bunch of food down with us, and they had some food. And we hooked up with 11 families down there that were single parent families. Um, and what happened, they had been without power for two weeks. So they lost all the food that they had. And since the family's in poverty, they have no margin. So there was, a, there was one woman in particular, when we came to her house, she was sitting on the couch and she was counting diapers and trying to figure out where she could go without to try to get food for her kids. So it was a really cool experience. I wanna thank you guys for all the, the donations you made and the prayer that you made. And uh, when Ray dropped some stuff off, she had written down this verse. And this verse spoke to me so much. This is the one before, it's from 1 Corinthians 15. And it says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that victory that we have in Jesus, we're gonna come back to that in this message. And we, that's how we should be living, man. Steadfast, immovable. We should be unshakable in the things that we do for God. When you guys do that, I know that you're not alone, man. We stand with you. So, on to what we're talking about this evening. I had two Red Bulls. So I'm really excited right now. Um, we're going to talk about the last lesson that Jesus is giving in this section that we've been going through. Not the last night in this series. There's still two more chapters in Matthew that we're going to go through. But he's been going through in uh, Matthew chapter 5, this whole time he's been laying contrasts between what the current thought process was in righteousness and laying out what righteousness really is in the heart of someone that's living in the kingdom of God, someone that's truly living this out, following Jesus. So at this point, Jesus has dealt with wrong attitudes about rage, about contempt, lust, obsessive thoughts, verbal manipulation, how to conduct ourselves in relationships, physical confrontations, legal confrontations, um, being responsible and the kind of heart that conducts itself in love in all these things. So the final thought process that he contrasts here is about how to treat our enemies. And it is in Matthew chapter five. And it's verses 43 through 48. And it says, you have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say you love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father and heaven is perfect. So Jesus is correcting a misunderstanding, an incorrect thought process on how to treat the people that are the most hostile towards us, the people who really wouldn't care one way or the other to learn that we died. And the Old Testament law he's teaching on is found in Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy 23, three through six. And none of that actually says, hate your enemies. That's just what the religious leaders at the time had interpreted that as. So this was really an extension of that lex talionis, the law of retribution that we were talking about last week. And people figured that if someone was seeking their demise, then they in turn should seek that person's demise. And like I said last week, most people read this and they tend to just throw their hands up in the air and walk away and take it out of context and having no understanding of what Jesus has taught up to this point, I can understand why, man. But having the understanding that Jesus is describing the characteristics found in the new heart. The new creation 
that we become doing life with him in God's kingdom. Understanding that Jesus has already laid out before this a step-by-step -step process on getting to this point. We can see this not only as possible, but just as the natural life response of who we are in Christ. So Jesus says here that not only do we love our enemies, but we're also to bless them, to do good to them, to pray for them. There's action associated with this. Love is a verb, man. There has to be action behind love, or it is not love. If I don't do something for my wife to know that I love her, she has no idea that I love her. There has to be action associated with it. So then he tells us why. He says that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So that means that we live our lives in a way that reflects God's love. A child has no choice but to be a reflection of their parents, either for better or for worse. That does not mean that we are held in bondage to live exactly like they did. But due to genetic makeup, there's undeniable similarities. And if we are living a life, trying to follow Jesus, living in God's kingdom, then it only makes sense that we should be displaying the characteristics of our Heavenly Father. So all throughout Scripture, there are references to people being sons of somebody. And it's used to describe the characteristics that are in their heart. The phrase sons of Belial is found many times in the Old Testament and was used to describe people who either in complete rebellion against God. Darren, would you turn the channel one down a little bit so I'm not yeah, no. feedback? Thank you, buddy. That's what Jesus would do. <laughs> So this phrase, sons of Allah, is found many times in the Old Testament. And it's used to describe people who were either in complete rebellion against God, and therefore all things good, or people that were worthless, that were filled with so much rage and selfishness that their hearts no longer held any worth for themselves or for others. And the phrase, sons of disobedience, is also found in Scripture, describing people whose hearts are not influenced by God, but by evil, people who are not necessarily evil people, but they have belief lies that have led their hearts to be controlled by demonic spiritual forces. That's what Paul's talking about in uh, the second chapter of Ephesians. And he lays out a contrast between a heart influenced by light and a heart influenced by darkness. Let me read that to make that all official, because if I paraphrase it, it'll be very poor. So he says, wow, so he says, <laughs> So he says that you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Paul's talking about this contrast between a heart that has the characteristics of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So again, all of this is just to say that this phrase, sons of, is meant to describe the characteristics that's in our hearts. So if, to have love in our hearts for even our enemies means that we are displaying characteristics of God. So Jesus also says, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God loves all people, man, all of us, even the worst ones. He's given us all the same chances, and he doesn't punish or bring judgment on us because he hates us, but because he loves us. Judgment from God should be something that we are wise enough, spiritually discerning enough, to see for what it is or realize that we need to change something. And that's what the psalmist means in Psalm 94, 15, when he writes, but judgment will return to righteousness, and the upright in heart will follow it. Judgment from God should be something that pulls us back into right standing with God, into being in a good place. It should be something that makes us wake up and go, I have made a bad choice, and I need to correct that. The heart that is self-seeking in terms of judgment from God is how could God do this to me? It takes no responsibility for the decisions that we have made. When our heart is in the right place, we realize that for what it is, and we correct ourselves and get back in line where we're supposed to be. So Jesus goes on to say, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren, your friends only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? 
And Jesus is making a couple points here. Tax collectors in Jesus' culture represented the very absence of any kind of moral compass. They were thieves, they were traitors. It would be close to an American culture saying there's not even Al-Qaeda through the city. And you think about that, man. Members of Al-Qaeda, the mafia, criminal organizations, terrorist organizations, they treat each other with love, and they hate the people who oppress them in any way. So if we do the same thing, there is nothing about the way that we are living our lives that sets us apart from them. Nothing that marks our life's lifestyle as being distinguished from their lifestyle. And that's the other big point that Jesus is making, and it's found all over Scripture. If we are following Jesus, we should be living in a way where people realize it, man. People should look at us and go, there goes someone that's following Jesus. It should stand out. So much damage has been done for the kingdom because of the way that we've become, we can be very vocal about being quote unquote Christian, but then we live life in a way that does not represent Jesus at all, man. Then what people see is this hypocrisy and they say, wow, that's fine. I want Jesus. I don't want that. That sucks. That does suck. They shouldn't want that. That's on us, man. That is not the life that we are called to live. There's so many studies out there about how Christians no longer live a life that is noticeably different from anyone else's. There's the same amount of divorce, alcoholism, drug addiction, porn addiction, death, gossip, slander, adultery. And that is just not the life that we've been called to live, man. This is what Jesus referred to earlier as the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus is teaching on how we need to exceed that righteousness, that level of goodness. We are called to live in victory over spiritual darkness in all its forms. Demons have no hold on us, man. No control, no influence, not even a second thought. And there is absolutely no spiritual darkness that can stand against the love of Christ. It's like a flaming wall that sends those creatures scurrying away for cover, man. And as we mature in our life with Jesus, that's the authority and the power that our lives should be displaying. And it should be noticeable, man. That's the last point that Jesus makes here. He says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Misunderstanding that verse, really this entire book, has led people to develop a God complex where they think that they are perfect. Where people think that they're being told that they need to be perfect, so they simply turn and walk away. And how far we have fallen from what we were meant to be, man, and how sad the human intellect is to read this and come up with that outcome. Because that is just simply not what Jesus is saying. We need to realize that this wasn't written in English, and it wasn't written last week. That word perfect is from the word teleos, and it means complete. It's translated in other parts of the New Testament as mature. It's also the root of where we get our word telescope from. So what happens when you look through a telescope, man? We see things much more complete, much more as they truly are. Instead of the moon being a bright circle, we can see differences in shades of color, differences of terrain, craters, mountains, and valleys. It's a much different picture. So Jesus is teaching that this love he is talking about is how we become mature, how we become complete. Love is the thing that is more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. If we look at this not understanding, the step-by-step -step process of transformation that Jesus has laid out leading up to this, this is impossible, man. But if our deepest feelings, our thought processes, our insecurities, vulnerabilities, the life desires, the very core of who we are in our hearts, if these have been penetrated with God's love, love that is not selective, that shows no partiality, that doesn't hold back, and this is just the natural response of who we are, man. This is a love that reaches every single person that we come into contact with. It's a love that no human being has the power to change or to take away from us because it comes from our hearts, from who we are in Christ, who we are as people who are living the kingdom life that Jesus is talking about. And no human can take that love away because it comes from Jesus, the Christ, and Jesus does not ever change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, understanding who we are in Christ is probably the biggest mistake in the modern church. That's what keeps us confined to four walls on Sunday morning, talking about how the world needs to change, and then just going home and living a completely untransformed life, man. That is not the life that Jesus has called to. So I'm going to close this out, man. So the dudes want to come back up and play. Logan, you're good, buddy. Darren's going to jump. Thank you for jumping in.
Um, if you guys know anyone, absolutely, buddy, go ahead. I don't know if to do this. In fact, I usually hate when people do this, but I feel the Lord really pressing on me. Set the mic up. Maybe I won't. I'm just gonna hold it. Um, but what Mike is talking about, uh, I feel the Lord is reminding me of a story. Actually, um, when I was 15 or 16, I taught a vacation in Bible school, and I had a little interaction with a kid. And Mike's talking about how. Uh, you know, we as Christians, and I realize we're all at different places in our walks with the Lord in the room. Some of us maybe just trying stuff out. Some of us, made this maybe old hat for us. We've been doing that 20 years, maybe. Who knows? But um, I had an interaction with a kid where we were describing what the love of Christ is. And the kid asked a couple of questions, and he says, uh, So you said that God lives within our hearts. And I said, Yep, He sure does. And he said, But you also said... God is bigger than us. And I said, yeah, God is bigger than anything you can imagine. And so, like a sage of his times, he follows it up with, if God lives within us and he's bigger bigger than us, wouldn't he show through? And, you know, this little kid has a picture of, like, Jesus' arms coming through. But the point that he's making is, is we as Christians should have Jesus showing through in everything we do. And that's what makes us different is that, we have such an abundance of love that it should outpour out of us, that it should be in everything we do. And I just, the Lord was trying to tell me to remind you guys that, you know, make sure that it shows through. Make sure that you're different. Make sure that we're not the same as everybody else because he's bigger than us and he's within us, so he's going to show through. So, thank you. Amen. Thank you, bud, for being obedient. Um, if you guys know anyone that would benefit from it, on this table, there are resources you can take about the depression groups that are around it, like uh, hospice groups for grief, uh, AA meeting this, quitting smoking. If you know someone that needs a Bible, take one and give it to them, man. So I'm going to close this out. Let's send, oh, you guys, you guys want to, there's a bucket there if you want to give. If you give, want to give, throw it in there, man. That doesn't go in our pockets. It pays our rent. And we have a partnership with Blue Vine Media, who is uh, uh, it's a really unique recording studio. It's committed to making quality music to counter everything that's on the radio. It's all about sex and drugs and you know, slutty chicks and getting hammered and that's why kids do it, man. To so present an alternative to that that's of the quality to replace that. So anyways, I'm going to close this out with Romans chapter 12, which says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, the perfect will of God, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, he will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are not a God that just calls us to live this life and leaves us out there to hang. You are a God who creates a new heart within us and turns us in to a creature who is capable of doing these things and following these things with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that every person in here tonight would walk out of here filled to overflowing with your love, filled with a commitment for you, 
to live this life that Jesus talked about, that we wouldn't be Sunday Christians, man, that this would be who we are, that we would live our lives in the victory that Jesus paid such a high price for. In his name, amen. So since Ryan's not here, I'm going to sing these last three songs and I can't sing, so I'm sorry, guys. There's nothing I can do about that.